This episode is brought to you by White Cloud Coffee Roasters, where every bean tells a story of adventure and passion. Nestled in the heart of Idaho's mountain wilderness, White Cloud has been mastering the craft of coffee for more than 38 years, bringing the spirit of the outdoors into every cup. Discover the difference in their premium beans, meticulously roasted to capture the essence of the mountains. From robust, full-bodied classics to creative flavored blends, White Cloud coffees are designed for you to appreciate the subtleties of premium coffee. Now, listeners of our podcast can get an exclusive 10% discount. Just use the promo code CREATIVITY at checkout. Visit whitecloudcoffee.com and use the code CREATIVITY for your 10% discount. Start your adventure today. Journey to whitecloudcoffee.com. Tap into your most original thinking, organize your ideas, and create the opportunities to launch your creative work. Unlocking your world of creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. Well, hello, friends, and welcome back to our podcast, Your World of Creativity. We continue to travel the globe talking to creative leaders about their experiences, and our guest today is certainly one of those leaders with more than 40 years of experience creating world-class brand experiences that really transcend borders. And my guest is Jeff Thatcher. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here. You've got some great projects under your belt, Jeff, like the Warner Brothers World in Abu Dhabi, the FM Global Center in Singapore. I love to read about your work with the F1 team with the Mercedes and AMG and, and a great book, The CEO's Time Machine. But these days, of course, our, many of our creative minds are on AI and how that's going to fit in to creative industries and, and creative leadership. Uh, what, what are you thinking about these days when it comes to AI? When it comes to artificial intelligence, there's two sides to it. There's the dystopian thinking about the future of AI. <laughs> whether we're going to be ruled by a machine. <laughs> and then it's the side of it where it's simply another tool in storytelling. Uh, I'm right now at the College Football Hall in Atlanta, and we're working on a new experience here that's going to leverage the power of AI to put guests in the game. Mm -hmm. And guess what? In the 19th century, they used the power of a pepper's ghost to put a performer in a story in a new way. And today we call that a hologram technology from the 19th century. And people were probably freaking out in 1862 when a magician came up with the pepper's ghost, but it's just technology. And you know what? I remember the first time I saw an animatronic. I was working at Lagoon Amusement Park and I was assigned to count light bulbs across the park. I know. Yeah. That really love that. love that. Yes. Off season, <laughs> off season, dark and cold. And my job was to count light bulbs. And walking through something, we had Dracula's Castle and the Terror Ride. And young, old animatronics. Again, animatronics, we think of Disney. But these animatronics go all the way back to the 14th and, you know, 15th, 16th century. There's this swan that was made, like, you know, I think in the 18th century in France. So I forget the name of it. There's another one. Marie Antoinette playing the piano. And then there's a swan, I think, in the UK. There's technology has been around forever. And it's all the technology. Theatrical lighting, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, video, film, 3D film, which goes back to at least the 1950s, right? Yes. All of this technology is simply to help us put people in our story. That's what we're trying to do. And AI allows us to put guests, yeah, to put people in a story that's so incredibly fun. I'll give you an example. I was doing a workshop last week on on leadership. And we had several participants. These are corporate executives who are coming in and we took their bio, we had edited their bios and, and wrote bios for them. And we actually did that by hand, human <laughs> being. But then we put their bio in the chat GPT4 and said, create me a rhyming song. So it did. Then we dropped that rhyming song, the lyric, that song into Suno. Did I pronounce it Sano, Suno, whatever? Hmm. Sano? which is a song making AI app. And we created an individual customized song for each of them less than five minutes per, 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 per person. Create yes. this song. 
Then when they came into the workshop, we had their song playing alongside other songs, like the, the ubiquitous, the Tina Turner, you're simply the best. Yes. Better than all. So I mean, you know, those typical songs you play as is walk in music and break music in a workshop that kind of get people excited, John, the Eagles, whatever. But then we would sneak in these songs and they were about them. It would be like, Mark Stinson, <laughs> creative theater, he's awesome. You know, so we create these songs and it was hilarious because the, before the workshop began, everybody gathered, nobody noticed. First break, nobody noticed. And then finally the, the lunch break, somebody went around the like, Am I catching the... I'm like, me, me. Then they listen and they were like, they laugh and songs were about them. The songs were about leadership. And it's simply a tool to tell a story. It's a tool to bring people into the experience. We get all like hyperventilating about AI and oh my gosh, what are we going to do? It's going to ruin our jobs. It's going to change the world. You're right. It is. But don't freak out. And the other story that I like to use, I worked on a project, a museum project a long time ago. It was an Iron Bridge, UK and, or Colbrookdale, Iron Bridge. And watch at Iron Bridge, the first Iron Bridge, it's where they invented the blast burner. Mm. And this guy, all he was trying to do was invent a better way to make a copper pot. He wanted to make a cheaper copper pot because iron is cheaper than copper. And wouldn't it be nice if I could make a cop iron pot cheaper? And so he invented the blast furnace. So he could use coke or coal, create a blast furnace, get it hot enough that he could melt that iron and make a iron pot. That's mm -hmm. what his objective. That's all he was trying to do. He had no idea that the imagination of the people around him were going to take that blast furnace and start making pistons and start making railways and start making rail ties and start making bridges and start making skyscrapers and unleash the industrial revolution because they can, with iron, make steam engines and all kinds of amazing cool things. And it's going to be true with AI. AI, we're going to use AI in ways that their creators never possibly imagined. Mm -hmm. And the same. Uh, we're we're going to use AI in ways that people have never imagined. And we're going to use it in the same way we use all other technology. We're going to use it to connect with each other. We're going to use it to tell stories. And that's what I'm excited about as a creative person on the AI front is it's another arrow in my quiver of experience design. And it honestly, people get all hyperventilated about it, but it's not any different than when they came out with interactive touch screen and 3D film and I tell you what, I was at a demo two weeks ago in Los Angeles for the first 3D LED screen out there in liminal space. And again, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an engineer. But when you project 3D, it shifts. That's why you have mm -hmm. glasses on. That's right. Yes. That works with a projection. It doesn't work with LED because you have these physical points of light. And so you can't shift it in the same way. And these guys figured out how to basically create an a 3D projection on an LED screen, and that gives us 10 times more depth back into the screen and 10 times more projection out from the screen. And plus it allows you to have a wider peripheral view of 3D so I can see it on a curved screen this way instead of just right in front of me. And that is going to unleash so many amazing storytelling opportunities or those of us who love to create stories and love to create experiences. And sorry, this is a uh, very long. No, day. but I really love it. I think we, we underscore, on, on, on. let's rewind and underscore a couple of points that experience design is putting the user, the customer, the brand in the story or in any way we can do that with tools, methods, techniques. And if we fought the, the transition from whale oil to electricity, where would we be? So look at all these, the opportunities that. The cotton gin did not, it was not a bad thing in replacing individuals. It was able to do more work. And, and let me say this, will it make people lazy? Yeah, it will. And you know what? If you go back and look at the, sorry, if I get this wrong, I apologize. But if you look at the Columbia space shuttle disaster, mm -hmm. right? Remember how it broke up in reentry? Mm -hmm. Remember what happened? So they actually did a report. And in that report, analyzing what happened, 
they actually wrote, seriously, like this was in the report saying, why did this tragedy happen? And I'm going to get the exact quote wrong, but I'm going to paraphrase the idea. Over-reliant on PowerPoint instead of the written word prevented the engineers connecting the dots. PowerPoint, put it another way, made the engineers lazy and they didn't connect the dots. Because if you have to write a report, if you actually have to write a narrative and you're sitting there writing it, you're writing that narrative about a report, you have to connect the dots. If you're putting together a PowerPoint, you're really not connecting the dots all Just the time. Just some random thoughts, like, yes. I find my creativity is much better if I sit down and I write, because writing is a creative process. If I write story, I write the presentation, and then I turn it into a PowerPoint. When I get lazy, and we're all guilty of this, Oh, I'll just do the PowerPoint really quick. I won't write it first because I'm busy. I'll just do the PowerPoint. It works, but it's not as good. Mm -hmm. And will, will the same true? Will AI make us lazy? Yes. But guess what? If you're one of those people that still believes in the creative process and still takes the time to do it right, you'll be better. Your ideas will be better mm -hmm. and you'll win. It's going to allow us to work faster for sure. I had an argument with a lawyer at church with the chair of the illustration department. Eh, argument's not the right word, but we were talking about AI and we were using AI in a rendering for a children's museum exhibit because we wanted to have this mural. So everything was created by hand by an artist in SketchUp and then an illustrator was painting it. But we wanted this mural on the wall of this exhibit. And we just went to Midjourney, typed in what kind of mural we want, grabbed that mural dropped it in, our illustrator mashed it up, blended the edges as they do with their pencil on the iPad. Mm -hmm. It was great and dark. And this chair of gold fish part was like, oh, thanks. You just took my job away. And I'm like, not really, because guess what? Before they would do that with AI, they'd go onto Google and say children's mural. <laughs> uh, possibly the same outcome. Yes. I remember my daughter Zoe, who's worked for us. She's a, an illustrator, been with us since 2019. And before that, she designed costumes. When she was in college, I allowed her to go shadow with Daniel West, who's one of the best concept illustrators in Los Angeles. Amazing. He did all the storyboards for Christopher Nolan, Inception, and uh, uh, Interstellar. He's just an amazing, talented guy. And I had her sit with, with Nathaniel for a day. And I picked her up at the end of the day in Pasadena, and I said, Zoe, what'd you think? And she goes, I think she's... Mm -hmm. And I'm like... He doesn't actually draw the rocks by hand. He just goes on to Google and types raw. <laughs> Finds a rock. So yes, AI is going to allow us to work a lot faster. And Zoe would argue that AI has made her a better designer because he's seeing how AI reacts to certain things she's doing. And she's, oh, why didn't I think of that? I should do that in my next rendering. Yes. So, well, that's um, very good. Uh, and I, I think about, uh, Jeff, when you're working across these different cultures and countries, the approach to creating experiences. I'd love to find that thread that you think about that says putting the person in the story has some common foundation across all these cultures. What have you found in your projects? I believe there are absolutely universal links. And everybody immediately goes to music. And it's true. Music is a universal language. No doubt. It is. But there are other universal languages. Geography the universal language. Why do we see in experiences across cultures, different experiences that embrace geography, whether it's models or maps or the globe, geography communicates on a level that transcends your culture and your language. Music and geography. What's next? Time. Time is a universal language. Again, go to any culture, go to any experience, go to any museum, doesn't matter where in the world you are, Time is a universal language. That's why you see a glockenspiel in Germany and you see a, you know, an astrological clock in Prague and then you go to somewhere else, see a sand dial or a sundial or you go somewhere else stand going through an hourglass. Time is a universal language. I also believe that light, not color, because colors mean different things in different cultures, but light is a universal language. You are a lighting designer. You are speaking in a language that transcends culture, transcends boundaries. I believe there are universal languages that transcend these things. I also believe that story 
is something that is universal. I think Joseph Campbell and others have proven that. And we use at the creative principles, we use something called the experience model that we believe not only is universal, but goes back our five did. We once wrote an article about the tabernacle in the wilderness and how the tabernacle will, if you look at it from the traction model, it follows the same principles that we use today. And what are those? First, you have to attract their attention, right? Whether it's a sign or an icon or theming like the castle at, at Hogwarts and Universal Studios, you attract their attention, right? Then there's trust. You have to draw people into the story. You have to build trust with them as they take their first step into that story. After trust, you give them the information they need to move forward in the journey. That trust, that information often is delivered in a pre-show. It's like about a theme park, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. There are different ways to deliver that information. Then you have internalized, where that story is internalized, where it's the main attraction, if you will. It's what you're there for. It's the Ark of the Covenant. Certainly would be the internalized in the tabernacle of the wilderness. And then finally, there's the challenge. What are you going to challenge them to do? Act, right? Get them to act. So you attract, you trust, you inform, you internalize, and you act. Okay, the Holocaust Memorial in D.C., right? The architecture draws you into that concentration camp aesthetic in a way that is eerie but appropriate. Then you begin your journey and you get the backstory of anti-Semitism and Nazism and that, that really helped to build that trust of, okay, they're going to give me more than just what happened to the Holocaust. They're going to build trust and give me more information to help me build that trust to get up the story. Then in form, there's a little, little vi- video vignette, little small theaters you step in to give you more information and more backstory. But it isn't, if you've been there, it's really until you go down, back down to the basement, cross a bridge, you go down to the basement, and you're immersed in the tragic scale of the Holocaust. You walk past thousands of shoes. You walk past thousands of family photos. You're immersed in the scale of that Holocaust and that story. That's where it really hits all. And then there's not a retail store where they want you to buy coffee cups that say Holocaust Memorial. Mm-hmm. No, they're under with an eternal flame. They want you to sit there and resolve what will never happen again. And that model works in every culture that I've encountered in my work. You attract their attention. You build trust. You give them the information they need to move forward in their journey. You internalize that message with emotion and heart. You challenge them. You get them to act. Mm-hmm. And models like that are really helpful in replicating. In other words, you could do this once and say, this was a very powerful experience, but how do you create these experiences time again and in different markets and in different industries or with different stories? You also address this in your book, The CEO's Time Machine, thinking about models to help leaders and help businesses navigate these challenging times. Uh, Why do models help us? grab onto things so that we can repeat our successes. I made experience design is like math. There's just formulas that work. Uh, and it sometimes they're really corny and real simple. When I worked at that amusement park when I was a teenager, I was a stage manager and the song and dance review, music USA, music across America. We would always end with the patriotic song Lee Greenwood's I'm proud to be an American. And what would we do? I would go backstage because it wasn't a very high end production. And I would literally hold down this toggle switch and a giant American flag would lower mm-hmm. while the performers are singing. And I'm proud to be an American. Or at least I know I'm free. And this flag would drop. And guess what? We got a standing ovation mm-hmm. every single mm-hmm. time. Of course. Guaranteed. Was it a formula? Or was it a model? Absolutely. Did it work? 100%. If Hollywood uses models, everyone uses models because they work. And there's nothing wrong with them. I mean, a model doesn't destroy your creativity. A model allows you some ways to unleash your creativity. This is why I asked the question, because sometimes uh, we creatives say, oh, it's so formulaic. Oh, it's so connecting the dots. So oh, it's overused kind of thing. But if you're following the model that you described, it says, does it do this? Does it do this? That's simply putting a yardstick on your work to see how it measures up. Oh, yeah. What's wrong with formulas? I don't think anything wrong with formulas. I, I think if we, if when we're complaining about it being formulaic or cliched, 
I think what we're really saying was they didn't tell a good, very good story. I have sometimes clients say, well, what happens if people complain about us spending so much money on their experience or their figure bit? Especially corporate clients. You're like, oh, I'm a little nervous that my clients will say, oh, this is why you cost so much. You spent all this money on this experience, right? I say to them, I'm like, okay, when you go to the movies and you leave the movie, if you say, as you walk out of the movie, that was a waste of money or that was a waste of my time, why do you say that? Mm. They're like, because the story sucked. I'm like, yeah, exactly. I walked out of Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor. Cool facts, but I was a turkey. You know what I mean? That was a waste of money. You didn't tell a good story. And it's hard to tell a good story. It is. It's very hard to tell a good story. I had a few turkeys. It's hard to tell a good story. But if we can tell a great story, nobody cares if it's formulaic. Nobody, nobody cares if one is basically Star Wars. Yes. Star Wars. Yeah. Nobody cares. Indiana Jones. Nobody cares that it's formulaic if it's a great story. Mm -hmm. Tell a great story. Yeah. And well told. Yes. Jeff, thinking ahead, we've been talking a lot about some of the new tools, methods, and some old proven ones. But what excites you about the, the creative work that you're doing? And wh what's ahead? That's a really good question. I, I think the thing that excites me the most is that all of the technology we have today allows us truly to work with people around the world. Right now, we're working with a team in New Zealand on this project called Wall of Fame. And it's so great to work with. Yes, they speak English, but Kiwis are very different. <laughs> and it's fantastic to be able to really work with people all over the world or different cultures. And I think that will get easier and easier as technology continues to flourish and connect us. That's great. What I'm really excited about, probably more than anything, is how AI will hopefully, and it's getting there, but not there yet, um, imagine being able to have a brainstorming session on Zoom where you don't have to have a translator. I did one of the most painful brainstorming calls I ever had was, it was during the close the pandemic time, but it was with a project in China and someone would say something and then be translated in Chinese and there'd be a conversation and then there and then we'd wait for it to come back. But A, the Star Trek Universal Translator is becoming a reality. And won't that be amazing for us to be able to work in ways that we've never had before because we can connect with people and talk with people and brainstorm with people in ways that we never have before. Mm -hmm. And thinking about uh, creatives who might be listening that say, I tell a good story. I have create good experiences. I would like to expand the reach and the scope of my work. You're now working on a global basis. How does somebody shift from simply doing good local or even regional work to having a greater impact across borders. Take a risk. Don't get comfortable with where you are. I left a very good, comfortable job in 2007, for example, to go work on the opening ceremonies of the Pan American Games in Rio. It was a risk. I hated it, but it really led to some new opportunities. I did the same after working seven years at JRA, experience design firm in Cincinnati. I left to go help CEO of the Tom Peters company write a book. It was a risk. So I would say every five to seven years, take a risk, do something risky. Doesn't necessarily have to be a grand plan or <laughs> yes. Just don't get comfortable. Take risk. You know what I mean? Marry the best possible wife amazing and so support. And without her, none of this would have ever been possible. Mm -hmm. Without her, I wouldn't have been able to go to Abu Dhabi for two months or Rio for three months, or, or she's very patient, very loving and supportive, and amazing and don't marry well. Mm -hmm. Right. Good advice. Jeff, I can't yeah. thank you enough for the conversation, right? So many good ideas, so many good experiences to learn from. Really appreciate you you, Mark, or great to be on. Yes. Uh, Jeff Thatcher, he's the author of The CEO's Time Machine. He does uh, global uh, user experiences, brand experiences, all sorts of uh, customer experience programs that we can learn a lot from. Really want to appreciate Jeff for sharing his insights and experiences and encourage you 
as he says, let's take some creative risk. Some of those are career risks. Some of those are risk with our work. Let's put the ideas out there. Let's find applications and measure them with some of these formulas and methods that Jeff has described. Stay tuned for our next episode of Your World of Creativity. We're going to continue our around the world journeys. We've stamped our passport in Georgia today, Creativity Center of Atlanta. Jeff works out of Savannah, which is a great creative center. But we're going to travel to all the creative capitals around the world. We're talking to practitioners about how they get inspired, how they organize ideas, and as we've discussed today, making the connections and gaining the confidence to get our work out into the world. So until next time, I'm Mark Stenson, and we'll keep unlocking your world of creativity. Unlocking your world of creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. This program was produced by BSB Media, creators of IntelliKey Leadership Stories, Unlocking Your World of Creativity, and thepeaceroom.love. Are you an author who's tired of the long waits and low royalties? Exact Rush is here to change the game. We specialize in publishing with precision, and we get your book to market in just three to six months, not years. But we're not just about books. We also support your photography, web design, and content creation needs. Our focus ranges from spirituality to pop culture, and we're excited about our diverse lineup of upcoming releases. So if you're ready to keep more of your hard-earned money and get published faster, Exact Rush is your ticket. Visit exactrush.com and turn your creative dream into a profitable reality today.